story from our hometown scrapbook by Ben Weatherwax. The Big Wind. I guess everyone was amazed at the Weather Bureau's reports of high winds in last week's Florida hurricane. 162 miles an hour is a lot faster than anything that the average man has ever seen. A 90 mile an hour gale is usually considered a cyclone, but here comes one nearly twice as fast. It's a wonder that anything was left of that sand pit that advertised as Florida. Now, I'm not going to set myself up as an authority on typhoons or hurricanes and tell you all about them. I have to speak as an acquaintance with them, however. I spent three days once in the Philippine Sea playing tug of war with a typhoon that tossed a co covey around as though it was composed of rowboats. And once, on a hop from Hawaii to Guam, I flew through the edge of a small-scale hurricane with four other passengers and a load of high-priority freight. One of the passengers was Jack Dempsey, the ex cupper who chain-smoked cigars while the plane stood first on one wing and then on the other. And then, back in 1947, I drove along the Gulf Coast from Pensacola to New Orleans, just behind the twister that had unroofed half the houses in the coastal area around Biloxi to the west of the Creole City. So I have a passing acquaintance with the big winds. But again, I repeat, I'm not setting myself up as an authority. I just want the reader of the yarn to know I understand about them. The biggest blow that hit Gray's Harbor in our time. You don't have to be a real old timer to remember this. It goes back to Sam Ben and the sawdust days of the 1880s. It goes back about 28 years in Grays Harbor to the year of 1921. January 29th it was, a blustery Saturday afternoon such as we have had along from time to time and feel right at home in, if you've got a good raincoat and a warm sweater. The harbor had been working its way back to post-war normality after the First World War. The shipyards that had sent a keel down the ways almost every week in the heart of their wartime building had slowed off, were now silent. The boys who had marched away with their service were home again and opening businesses of their own. Stan Delosh, now Aberdeen's health officer, had come back from the war and was building himself a service station right where the George J. Wolf Company store now stands. Payrolls in Hope William had topped $4 million a year, and South Bay residents were being promised an improved road to the beaches in the spring. Well, about the middle of the afternoon, the gust of wind that had been blowing in from the ocean began to level off steadily. High wind. It grew, it blew faster and faster, and then came some terrific gusts that blew people down in the streets. Some of the residents who had lived in the plain states of Kansas and Nebraska before they moved out here battened the hatches for a tornado. But it wasn't acting like that sort of wind. It was a straight, high-powered, blow-down wind that began to roar and soon roared through the harbor city. Now, in those days long ago, the business of weather prognication was pretty simple. The weatherman read his instruments and took a squint at the sky, and his prediction might or might not be right. One thing was certain, high winds were coming out of the range. If the bottom dropped out of the barometer, he could only predict that something big was going to happen. But what? He wasn't quite sure. So there was no warning of the big blow. Before everyone fully realized what was up, it was on us. In the streets of Hoquiam, pedestrians ducked into doorways and clung to the faces of buildings for support. Signs were torn off the stores and sent spinning down the streets. 
The early model cars of that day had trouble moving against the blow, and some of them, most cars of the era, were open tops. Some of them had their tops ripped off by the blast. At the height of the storm in Hoquiam, portions of the old Hoquiam Theater were torn loose and flung about, and A. L. Lind was badly injured by flying debris. At the Northwestern Mill, the roof was torn off the lumber shed, and a tally man was badly injured when the tumbled across the yard and struck him. Telephone poles snapped at their bases and came down in a tangle of wires, and trees were uprooted and came crashing down. Along 8th Street, which was the main street in Hopewim, nearly every other store building had its plate glass torn out, and the wind whipped into the building, damaging merchandise and upsetting the fixtures. Some of the buildings had their skylights ripped right off the top and tossed around, and other skylights were smashed when chimneys were blown over and the bricks tossed through the air. Oh, it was a really big blow. On the Aberdeen side of Myrtle Street, the same sort of thing was happening, but death was riding the winds over in Aberdeen. The blast came so suddenly that people were unaware of it until it hit them. Some of the waterfront workers later reported that they could see it coming up the harbor, blowing spray ahead of it like a white cloud. Then it hit. It sent hats spinning down the streets, smashed plate glass windows, took out telephone poles and trees just as it had in Hopewim. But down at the foot of Broadway, at the Anderson Middleton Mill, it took a heavy toll. A four-towering smokestack from their boilers stood together like a cluster of black pipes, their guys lacing through like a giant spider web. When the wind hit the stacks, they crumpled like paper and went down, heavy steel cylinders, hot and thrown with the full force of the wind right across the mill's engine room. The crash, which on a calm day might be heard a mile away, was scarcely audible over the Heron Street above the rush of the wind, but the sound of escaping steam and the sirens of the city's fire trucks that were immediately called to the scene told the whole town that the wind was doing its worst. When firemen reached the mill, they found a scene of desolation. The stacks had shattered steam lines, and engineer A. A. Brown was dead beneath them, scalded by the jets of steam. Jesse McMinn, the mill's electrician, was also buried in the wreckage, but firemen working frantically pulled him to safety, still breathing from the debris. He was badly scalded, but prompt medical attention saved him to tell the tale of this awesome moment. The team, a team of horse hauling a wood wagon were caught by one of those stacks and were killed where they stood. The engine room of the mill was a mass of wreckage, and it was here that the harbor suffered its biggest single loss. However, damage was widespread. Roads were blocked as far as up country as Oakville, and trees uprooted and thrown across the highways and barns, and everything was blown down. Fences were leveled, orchards stripped. The residence of Ed Clare up near Saginaw was moved off its foundation. The roof was torn off the whaling station down at Bay City, and signboards, one of the principal targets of the wind, were laid out the length of the county. Nor was all the damage restricted to populated areas. In the upper reaches of the Olympic Peninsula, the storm cut a wide swath through the finest stands of fir and hemlock timber. Trees were toppled on several million acres. In places, they were moved down as, mowed down as though they were giant, it was a giant side had been swung across them. Well, the weatherman had crawled out from under his bed and looked at his instrument. He reckoned that they had wreaked a havoc of a 90 mile an hour gale, and that, though it was never accurately reported, was about the estimate of others who had been through heavy blows in other parts of the world. The harbor was a long time crawling out from under that one. Oh, it did, as it managed to weather most upheaval since the long ago days when Sam Ben and George Emerson decided that this was a good place for folks to live. On Monday, most places were doing business as usual. The glass people were doing business as usual. Plate glass was a premium, and the glaziers were working around the clock to get the holes plugged against the usual January weather. 
The big Anderson Middleton plant was out of operation for a while to rig a temporary stack and then some of its boilers back in operation. However, they made plans at once for the biggest brick smokestack that the harbor had ever seen and the second one of its kind to be raised here. The first one had to be built a few years before at the old western mill, later Donovan number two, when that mill was working around the clock cutting ship timbers in the wartime fleet. The whole town watched the Anderson Middleton stack go up and it's one of Aberdeen's landmarks today standing there at the foot of Broadway. Telephone poles were replaced, trees planted where others had been uprooted, and it wasn't long before the people had all but forgotten the big blow. There were some who hadn't. Like most things of its kind, it was a shared tragedy for the community. There were a lot of kids in the Brown family, must have been half a dozen, most likely red-headed fellows and girls, and when their dad, the engineer at the Anderson Middleton, was killed, things looked pretty black for them. But the community, which shows its biggest heart when tragedy strikes, took them under their wing and helped. They couldn't make up for the family's loss, but they tried and did what good-hearted people usually do in such circumstances. As soon as the big wind was pushed into the background by other events, and became the sort of history that turns up here in our hometown scrapbook. But old-timers, whose memories of the harbor go back further than 1921, will want to something said about the blow of 1909, when they had another one back then. And it was something to recall, too, though it didn't hit the clip of the 1921 howler. In 1909, a whistling wind came in from the sea and flattened most everything around the cities. Telephone poles, trees, some small buildings, the staging at the Lindstrom shipyard, mill sheds, windows, all went by the big blast. For three days, the harbor was cut off from communication from the outside world as telephone and telegraph lines were snapped. The wireless operator at the Coast Guard station at Westport had to leave his post as the wind drove the water up the beach and threatened to wash away the station. It was a real howler. The wind in the 1909, but the one that the old timers talk about when they unfurl the yarn about big winds is the 1921 blow and the nearest thing to a hurricane that Grays Harbor has ever witnessed. And if you know your way around the Olympic Peninsula, you can still find scars of that long ago windstorm. While most of the timber blown down was later salvaged and marketed, mostly by the Polson Company, there were places where small stuff lies tangled and littered with a new crop of trees growing up in between. It's enough to remind the old timers of the day it happened and the nearest thing to a hurricane that we can find in this, our hometown scrapbook. Thanks for listening. Thank you.